We've all had the experience of being repulsed by the smell of somebody's body odour. But have you ever experienced liking somebody's smell? Particularly somebody that you're sexually attracted to. And I'm not talking about liking their perfume or their aftershave. I mean really liking and being attracted to the smell of them. The smell of their body odour. I certainly have had this experience, and I imagine that a lot of you have as well. But why is this? Why are we repulsed by the smell of some people, but we're attracted to the smell of others? Well, as with all questions about biology and behaviour, the answers are found through the evolutionary view. To understand the phenomena regarding how we perceive the smell of people's body odour, I need to tell you a little bit about a very specific set of immunity genes that are present in most vertebrates, including us humans. This set of genes is known as the Major Histocompatibility Complex, or MHC for short. Within each person, the MHC is a completely unique set of genes that play a large role in our immune systems. The genes of the MHC produce amino acids that affect our body odour, and the MHC also determines which species of bacteria are able to survive on our skin and in our sweat. These bacteria produce a range of volatile compounds that we can smell, and thus the unique composition of bacteria on our body contributes to our unique body odour. So basically, each person's unique MHC contributes significantly in determining their unique body odour. But what has that got to do with sex and mate choice? Well, you probably all know that inbreeding is a very bad thing. Inbreeding leads to what is known as inbreeding depression, which is basically a reduction in biological fitness of our offspring. Inbreeding depression in humans has been found to be strongly associated with all kinds of bad things, such as birth defects, low IQ and poor cognitive performance, increased susceptibility to disease and parasites, and much, much more. Therefore, as a general rule of thumb, it's beneficial for you to have offspring with somebody that is genetically different from you. And picking mates that are genetically different from you is something that biologists call disassortative mating. Another example of how disassortative mating can be beneficial can be seen in our ongoing evolutionary battles with parasites, a problem that all animals and plants face continuously. In brief, over many generations, parasites will evolve adaptations to infect people with the most common genes present within a given population because common genes are what the parasites come into contact with the most. This means that having a rare set of genes could be advantageous because the local parasites will not have evolved adaptations to infect people with these rare genes. This may be particularly important specifically when it comes to the genes of the MHC because they play such a significant role in immunity and defense against parasites. So, disassortative mating is one way of ensuring your offspring will inherit new genes that may in turn provide them with an evolutionary advantage like defense against local parasites. Because of the advantages of disassortative mating, over many many thousands of years, natural selection will have favoured the evolution of mechanisms within us that help us to select optimal mates and minimise inbreeding. So regarding the MHC, remember I told you that everybody's MHC is unique, and remember that your MHC determines what your body odour smells like. Well the result of this is that your body odour is basically a unique form of identification, almost like an ID card for you and for you alone. Now combine this with the fact that diversifying sets of genes in your offspring has many advantages. It then follows that, over evolutionary time, people that perceived the body odour of MHC dissimilar people as attractive would have been favoured by evolution because these people would have chosen MHC dissimilar people as their mates. In turn, this would have provided the advantages of new MHC genes to their offspring. On the other hand, those that were attracted to the smell of people with similar MHCs to themselves would have produced weaker offspring and would have thus lost in the evolutionary battle of reproductive competition. Seeing as we exist today, we must descend from many ancestors that made evolutionarily wise decisions regarding mate choice. So what if I told you that we may actually use the smell of people's body odour to make the optimal decision when picking a mate? Well, that is what I'm telling you. So let's begin the fun part of looking at some of the evidence to support this claim. The first experiment on MHC-based mate preferences in humans was conducted in 1995 by a group of scientists led by Klaus Wiedekind. In this study, 49 women and 44 men, all averaging around 25 years of age, had their MHCs genetically screened for comparisons. Each man was given one t-shirt and was instructed to wear it when sleeping for two nights in a row. After this, each of the women were presented with six of these t-shirts, three for men with dissimilar MHCs to them, and three for men with more similar MHCs to them. The women were then asked to smell the six t-shirts they were given and rate the intensity of the odour and the pleasantness and sexiness of the smell. The results were pretty amazing. The women were more attracted to the body odour of the men that had MHCs that were genetically different to them and they perceived the odour of these men as being more pleasant and sexy. But the opposite pattern was found when the women rated the odour of men that had MHCs that were more similar to them. Additionally, 
When the women were rating the odour of MHC dissimilar men, the smell reminded them of their current or ex-mates twice as often as when they were rating the odour of MHC similar men. This experiment became known as the Sweaty T-Shirt Study, and its results inspired a lot of further research into the MHC and mate choice in humans. For example, in 1997, Carol Ober and colleagues studied mate choice in a communal ethno-religious group that settled in South Dakota in the 1800s. This group, known as the Hutterites, descend from only 400 founding members. They have quite strict religious and cultural customs, and they rarely marry people that aren't Hutterites themselves. As a result of this, and the fact that they all descend from a fairly small founding group, they are quite an inbred population relative to others. Maximising genetic differences between mates may thus be especially important in such populations. In Ober's study, the researchers took 411 Hutterite couples and looked at how MHC dissimilar wives were to their husbands. The results showed that the married couples were more MHC dissimilar than would have been expected from random mating, i.e. by chance. This supports the hypothesis that MHC-based disassociative mating can occur in humans and that we are indeed able to discriminate based on genes in the MHC. If you think these results are impressive, just wait, because the plot thickens. Several studies investigated not just mate choice, but also the way that MHC similarities between romantic partners correlate with other aspects of mating, such as relationship satisfaction and sexual satisfaction. A 2006 study by Garva Apgar and colleagues found that as the number of MHC genes shared between romantic partners increased, women were less sexually responsive to their partners, were less sexually aroused by their partners, were more sexually attracted to men other than their partners and fantasised about them more, and to top it off, they also reported having more extra pair sexual partners, which is basically the scientific way of saying that they cheated more. These effects seem to be heightened during the fertile phase of the women's ovulation cycles. Interestingly, as MHC similarity increased between romantic partners, women also had fewer orgasms with their partners during their fertile phases. Another study in 2016 by Chroma and colleagues produced similar results to the 2006 study and the 1995 Sweaty T-shirt study. But interestingly, they also found that women in romantic relationships with men that have similar MHCs to them were significantly less likely to want children with these men. Speaking of men, an important thing to note is that men have sometimes been shown to follow a similar tendency to women when it comes to MHC-based body odour preference, but overall, the strength of the tendency is still much more apparent in women. Moreover, for men, when it comes to sexual satisfaction, extra pair fantasies, extra pair sexual partners, and desire to have children, these aspects don't appear to be mediated by MHC similarity as much as they are in women. This makes sense because evolution has selected for women to be significantly more choosy than men on average when it comes to selecting mates which is also true of females across most of the animal kingdom. But more about that in a future video. There is one more very interesting discovery from these studies, and it goes all the way back to Wiedekind's sweaty t-shirt study of 1995. The interesting find was the effect that contraceptive pills had on MHC-based attraction. Out of the 49 women in the study, 18 of them were taking the contraceptive pill, and they tended to have the opposite perception of body odours. They rated the body odours of MHC similar men as being more pleasant and sexy than the odours of MHC dissimilar men. This reversal of preference has been found in many other studies since then, and shows that hormonal contraception interferes significantly with natural mate choice in women. So let's think that through together for a second. If the hypotheses regarding MHC-based mate choice are correct, but hormonal contraceptives reverse women's naturally evolved MHC-based odour preferences, then we would expect that women on hormonal contraceptives might not be able to make the evolutionarily optimal decision when choosing a mate. But is there any evidence that mating with somebody that is MHC similar to you is actually a bad choice in the evolutionary sense? Well, there is some, and honestly, it's quite alarming. In 2017, Birnbaum and colleagues compared the health of children born to parents who met while the mother was on the pill to the health of children born to parents who met while the mother was not on the pill. The results were in line with what evolutionary theory predicts. Among the couples who met while the mother was on the pill, the children were significantly more prone to infections, suffered high frequencies of sickness, required more medical care, and were generally perceived as less healthy than children born to couples who met while the mother was not on the pill. It should be noted that this is just one study, and from what I can find, there has not been much investigation into how MHC-based mate choice directly affects the health of offspring. But as it fits with what evolutionary theory would predict, and as this may be signalling something quite serious for human health and well-being, it's certainly something that should be looked into in more detail. So perhaps one of you watching this can base your PhD research on it. Interestingly, this study also found that among the study couples that met while not on the pill, only 3.5% of these couples ended in divorce, but among the couples that did meet while on the pill, over three times that amount, 11.5% ended in divorce. So this again supports some of the previous findings about MHC similarity and relationship satisfaction. 
There are also some more data that are really quite upsetting, so please consider yourself warned. Some studies, for example a 1996 study by Keyshaw and colleagues, and a 1998 study led by Carol Ober, found that MHC similarity between romantic partners might be correlated with experiencing recurrent miscarriages. Women that experience recurrent miscarriages appear to be more MHC similar to their partners than women who do not experience recurrent miscarriages are to their partners. More precisely though, it looks like the sharing of some very specific MHC genes between partners, rather than of overall MHC similarity, is what might be associated with recurrent miscarriages. But, from the evolutionary view, it's possible that in these cases, the rejection of a fetus by a mother's body could actually be an evolutionary adaptation to prevent her having offspring that are sired by an MHC similar male. However, and it's a very big however, this finding regarding correlations between MHC sharing and miscarriages is certainly not a firmly established trend. Furthermore, a 2015 meta-analysis by Tess Muehlman and colleagues showed that there were issues with the methods used in most of the studies that investigated MHC sharing and miscarriages, such as differences in the use of certain definitions between studies, known as information bias, and also non-random sampling, known as selection bias. But even with these important caveats, it's still a very interesting aspect of MHC-based mate choice that warrants further investigation. Speaking of caveats, even though I've just spent ages telling you all this cool stuff about smell, sex and mate choice, there are also a lot of examples where the patterns I've been describing don't seem to occur. For example, in 2008, a fairly large study by Shea and others looked at the genomes and the MHC regions of couples in European American populations and African populations. They then calculated the similarity of genomes and MHCs in the couples within these two separate groups. It was found that, among European Americans, romantic partners were significantly MHC dissimilar to one another, showing disassociative mating that fits with the predictions and patterns discussed before. What was interesting, though, was that in the African population, romantic partners were neither significantly similar or dissimilar to one another with regards to their MHCs, but they were significantly more similar to one another at the genome level than would be found through random mating, which suggests that assortative mating, as opposed to disassortative mating, is occurring within the African population. This is not the only study that has found results that go against the patterns I've been discussing in this video. For example, a recent meta-analysis published by Havlicek and colleagues in 2020 illustrated that, depending on how the data from previous studies are pooled and analysed, you often find no overall correlation between MHC and mate choice, odour preference or relationship satisfaction. But if that's the case, then why the hell did I just waste your time with this video in the first place? Well, the reason is, despite the findings of Havlicek's 2020 meta-analysis, the authors didn't argue that human MHC-based mate choice isn't occurring. Rather, they highlighted the problems with the previous research and then detailed directions for future research that would help resolve these problems and answer some of the unknowns within this field. A nice illustration of the scientific community staying on its toes and remaining self-critical in its quest for truth. Many other biologists think that despite the issues with some of the past research in this area, there is certainly enough data and evidence to signal that there is something going on when it comes to MHC-based mate choice in humans and there are many reasons in line with evolutionary theory that might explain why the general pattern of MHC-based mate choice doesn't seem to appear in certain populations. Take the findings that show that some African populations don't appear to select mates based on MHC difference. It may be that socio-economic factors play a big part in such patterns. For example, for a woman in a poverty-stricken population of any country, picking the biologically and genetically optimal man for her might not be the actual optimal mate choice if this man isn't in a position to provide resources for her and her offspring. In such circumstances, choosing a man that has high economic, educational and social status may have benefits that far outweigh the costs of this male not being the biologically optimal mate. And we know from many other studies within evolutionary psychology that when it comes to picking a long-term mate, women across all cultures place a higher premium on cues of resource acquisition than they do physical looks in men. So it's important to remember that mate choice is context dependent. There are also cultural practices that may go against what evolution originally selected for, like traditions of not selecting mates outside of one's very close-knit caste or community, or the promotion of cross-cousin marriages that are seen in many Islamic cultures. Practices such as these could lead to couples being more MHC similar than would usually be expected. Then there are modern behaviours that might be affecting things too. The use of perfumes and strongly scented cosmetics like body washes and shampoos, as well as practices like shaving armpit hair. All of these could be having effects on our body odour and the way we perceive that of others, which in turn may affect our mate choices. So, as pointed out by Havlicek and others in their 2020 meta-analysis, there are many aspects of MHC-based mate choice in humans that need to be studied further in order to get a full picture of these phenomena. But until then, I want you to think about this video the next time you snuggle up with your partner, or the next time you're getting a bit close with that person you've got a crush on. Do you like their smell? How does it make you feel? 
Can you relate to any of the stuff that's been discussed in this video? Please leave a comment below and tell us all about it, because I'd love to hear from you people about this. Until next time, stay safe and stay curious. Oh, and of course, hit the like button, subscribe, and tell your friends about this video.